McCoy. Andrew uh, was a co-founder of the Digital Harbor Foundation in Baltimore, which is a not-for-profit group dedicated to after-school programs for empowering youth uh, for learning uh, technologies in the 21st century. And what Digital Harbor Foundation is now doing is they're turning rec centers um, in inner city areas in Baltimore into tech centers. So can we give a warm round of applause for Andrew, Andrew Coy? Thank you, Todd. Uh, and first off, I'd like to say thank you for this opportunity uh, that we had sponsored and made the ETI Summit possible, especially uh, the EGB as well as MindGrub uh, and uh, Case Next, a Venable uh, Foundation for their great support, and uh, Jones and Bartlett. So, uh, you know, what I'm, I'm pleased to be here and to address you guys today about EdTech for Tech Ed uh, and what I mean by that and where I see things going. Um, the, you know, the whole entire conversation that has been happening today is all about how, how are we going to innovate and create the next generation of, of leaders for this country, for our, our companies, you know, and my question is how, how can we empower students uh, today to feel like they can take their place in that future? Uh, and in education in general, you know, there's, there's a lot of confusion. We're at an inflection point, uh, and I propose that if you don't feel confused, that you're not asking enough questions, uh, you know, and and that's actually what I like to kind of just set off uh, as the beginning and, and level set to say, let's talk about some of the things that we're confused about in education. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and take just two or three people shouting out, name something that confuses you uh, about education or education technology. Yeah. Yeah, the format is still staying the same for teacher lectures. Yeah, format question. You know, that's an excellent thing to be confused about. Outcome versus learning. Yes, outcome versus learning. Uh, classroom orchestration. Yes, classroom. And, 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 you know, one of the things that I am particularly confused about is how do you measure the effectiveness of education? Uh, you know, how, how do you measure that? Is, is a test given at the end of a set amount of time, you know, that students are, are in the education system, you know, effective measure of the education system? It's, it's, it's created its own system to measure itself. And is that effective? In fact, uh, uh, others are also confused by this. And two teachers, Sean, uh, Sean uh, Wheeler and Ken Kozar, came out from Cleveland last year to Baltimore uh, and spent a weekend working on a, on a project, an idea uh, with me. And, and the question they said is, you know, how did school do, right? And, and could, they, they wanted to know, could you take social media platforms and leverage them as a, as a way for people to talk about that question five, 10, 15 years out of, of the education system and, and provide feedback to say, how did education do? Uh, what was it that was, that was most valuable in the real world, in the, in the life that it was supposed to be teaching and preparing you for? Uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about you know, some of the things that I've seen uh, about how did school do and what we're doing in the informal learning space, the out of school time, to, to create some new models, to, to break some of those molds and see if we can come up with a different way of doing the things that we do uh, in education and, and specifically to generate more technologists to help us solve some of these other problems that we have as well. Uh, so one of the people that I, I really look to and read uh, and enjoy what he has to say is Will Richardson. Uh, he's one of the godfathers of EdTech, one of the first teachers to really leverage blogging as a platform for connected learning uh, and having students creating content, interacting in, in a real world space. He, he's written quite a few books, speaks all over the country, but one of the things uh, that he wrote recently was a book called Why School? And in Why School, he asks a lot of questions. It's an e-book, it's about 100 pages, uh, and, and it's like $3, two, $3. Uh, so in, in this book, Why School, he talks a lot about the difference between information uh, scarcity which is a lot of the mindset of, of the current education system, and information abundance, which is the reality of the world we live in. You know, in, in the information scarce environment, you have an expert who has gone through a lot of trouble to learn information at a specific location somewhere else, and is now bringing that information with them and disseminating it to a group of students who need to learn that. It, there's a, a certain number of things you need to learn. Uh, you are learning standards. Uh, it's, not, it's not relevant in the world we live in. I mean, think as Del Dorley, the founder of Make Magazine said, you know, think of how you learn how to use your smartphone. 
Uh, think of you know these, these other things where it's it's not at all prescribed. It's not at all dictated, and in fact, it's not even known what you could do with that. I mean, think of the Xbox Connect and what people have done to plug it into something besides an Xbox, uh, and, and that wasn't even initially anticipated, but through kind of this maker culture, through this sort of hacker mentality, not hacking as the negative connotation of stealing something, but rather repurposing like a hacksaw, uh, you know, the, these, these things and making something new of it. So in an information abundant age, you know, you see all sorts of, of access questions saying, can you find out something? Because if you can find some piece of information, why memorize it? Uh, and, and the focus really should then be on learning how to learn. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about uh, is, is the process of learning how to learn and how to inspire youth to, to kind of grab a hold of that and say, I can learn. Because what a student decides to do when they're not told what to do will tell you a lot more about their success and their future success than any test score, any numeric value uh, of their past achievements. So what they, what they elect to do when they're not told what to do. Uh, and, and in an information abundant age, it's interesting to see what students do in the after school hours uh, as, as an indicator of their, their engagement with learning in general. Uh, and, and this leads to kind of the question of delivery versus discovery as a, as a mindset for education. Right, the, the old factory model, uh, and if you read Sir Ken Robinson, he talks a lot about this factory model of education where we're organized you know, by batches. You're, what grade you're in is you know, the class of 2015, 2016, 2017, as though, as he says, the, the date of manufacturing uh, matters more than, than other things like skill level, uh, interests, and, and specific pathways. Uh, you know, this old sort of model of delivery uh, focuses on repeating the same things over and over again, having these best practices that everybody does, uh, instead of, well, and, and that really talks about the teacher being the one responsible for learning. Teachers are evaluating on whether students are learning, uh, but, but in a discovery mindset, the students are the owners of their learning, and the students are the ones who are discovering, and what's the most important thing in that is that the students know how to learn. Because I couldn't tell you what you needed to know if you're working you know, 30 years from now, much less, or five years from now, for much less 30 years from now, and yet our students are gonna be working in those environments and we're pretending to know what they need to know for, for those, those careers and those future things that haven't been invented yet, and yet, you know, in an information abundant age, we should really be focusing on helping them learn how to learn and, and enjoying the process of learning. You know, and, and one of the things that Will Richardson has, has talked about and said is this phrase of just in time versus just in case. You know, how often has that been used as the standard justification for learning something? Just in case you need to know this at some point. You know, in an information abundant age, do away with the just in case and, and start talking about just in time. Uh, because so many things are instantly accessible, whereas before you weren't carrying around, you know, the sum of human knowledge in your pocket. Uh, you know, it was a scarce environment, and one in which failure was to be avoided at all costs. Um, and, and so you had to memorize things and repeat it and regurgitate without the assistance of any, any sort of other um, you know, helps. And that's really what, what I see uh, the, the education system needing to adapt to is this, this shift in, in from what it is you're learning to how to learn. Uh, and you know, going a different direction rather than a, simply a better execution of the current direction. Uh, so this idea that, that we should be better at doing the things we're already doing, uh, I think is, is false. Uh, we should do education differently. Uh, one, one example that I've heard of this uh, you know, is, is about a ship that sailed across the Atlantic, it was the USS United States, sailed across the Atlantic uh, in 1954, 19 hours faster than any other ship had ever sailed across the Atlantic, but nobody's heard about it. And currently it's sitting dry dock in Philadelphia, uh, going to be scrapped or turned into a museum piece, depends if they can raise enough money for it. The reason nobody's heard of it though, is because two years prior to that, the first transatlantic airline, uh, jetliner, went across the Atlantic. So, you know, a jetliner versus a fast ship, it's, it's a matter of doing things differently, not doing them better. 
Uh, and, and I feel like we're at that same sort of moment in education and education technology, uh, this inflection moment. And deciding what that different is, uh, is really important, or rather showcasing what it is. Because it's not something that we're just going to say should be this way. It's something that we have to demonstrate and, and give evidence for uh, and give examples because so many administrators are very risk averse. You know, that was one thing that lots of the panels talked about is they want to know that your company's going to be around a while because a new startup, you know, if it's not here and they've now invested time and energy into disseminating kind of what that program is, that can be very cost, you know, uh, costly to them. But, but in an age of, of constant change, you know, we need to have examples and, and showcase how that should look. And so to, to quote now, to put up a quote from Will Richardson, he says about this shift and what he sees changing, you know, it's really a matter of instead of teaching a subject or content area, you teach skill sets. Instead of teaching math or science, you teach a student how to learn math or science. Uh, and, and what they're learning uh, then de is determined by what's relevant for their needs. And there, there has to be a trust there, a trust that, that they will learn what is necessary and they'll be able to identify that. But if we don't trust our students to learn without us teaching them, you know, then, then we've just limited education to be the first you know, 18, 18 years of someone's life or if they go to college, more. But, but really, we talk about lifelong learning. Uh, and, and my only question about lifelong learning when, when people are saying, well, that's why people should you know, pay really expensive amounts to go to college is lifelong learning shouldn't cost so much. Lifelong learning should be something you do uh, and enjoy, and, and with all these, these resources we have uh, on the internet, it should be something that is accessible. So this, this idea of better versus different, many of you have probably seen this picture uh, on, well, on both pictures, uh, but the one of the teacher is circling the internet recently. Uh, this teacher, I guarantee you, he's, well, he's, he's worn the same shirt for his photo for 40 years. He's a math teacher. Um, you know, and I guarantee you, though, he's a better teacher now than he was when he started. But I would ask the question, is he a different teacher? You know, because he is better at teaching math now than 40 years ago. But, but look at the world, I mean, in the, in the, the infographic that MindGrab helped you know, create and talk about this changing world. The world's a very different place. And it's happened by things that have, hap that have gone on outside of the education space. So when it's a very different world, is being a better teacher the answer to that? And that kind of brings me to the head of, of talking about the factory versus a lab. So, you know, Seth Godin uh, wrote about this recently and was talking about, you know, this idea of failure. And, and, and I would propose that in a factory model, failure was to be avoided at all costs. Because any time a factory line piece failed, it would stop the whole system. Uh, but in an innovation economy, a knowledge-based economy, Failure is the pathway to success because the more you fail and learn from those, the better your, your innovations will be uh, and the more effective the outcomes. So we have this old system that's teaching kids not to try things that they can't succeed at uh, because they'll fail. And failure is such a decisive you know, uh, and final statement. It, it, you fail the test uh, when, when really you just didn't get the answer right, but you know, get it right the next time. Uh, should be the right response, or as I like to say, and, and it's on the next slide, is failure, the, or rather the only failure is failing to improve. Uh, and, and that sort of shift in, in how we talk with kids uh, about failure where, you, you know, it's not remediation, it's just retrying. Uh, it, it's not giving up, it's grit, it's determination, it's all of these things. Because in the lab, you know, you are exploring and developing new ideas. And here, here are two actually photos, two sets of photos. You know, the one the photo on the very top is actually the, uh, a Gillette factory. Uh, and the one there next to it is a high school. Um, you know, and, and they're designed very similarly. And, and that was not uh, an accident. We were preparing people to take a place in the factory, but those factories are gone. Uh, and, and so that system that used to serve our needs very well <coughs> doesn't anymore because the lab uh, is what we need now. Uh, and, and what are we doing to create a lab-like environment in our schools? Um, you know, and, and here you see obviously the two Steves working on a project. Uh, and and there, there's two people in our, in our tech center, which I'll talk about in a second, who built in eight days a 3D printer. 
uh, you know, here's a, he's a ninth grader who, who now has built a 3D printer uh, and, and knows not only how to use one, but how to make more of them. Can use his 3D printer to print pieces of his 3D, of his 3D printer. Um, you know, and, and here's that, that quote, the only failure is failing to improve. And I really believe that I constantly say it to my kids because they don't hear that elsewhere. Uh, you know, they, they hear about all these other problems that happen when you fail at something, so they, they avoid failure. Uh, and so because of all this, especially in STEM-related topics, we have a problem. We have this gap. We don't have enough people who are scientists, who are engineers, technologists, uh, or, or mathematicians. We don't, because these subjects require so much failure to get where you're going to, to then have a success, you know, 10,000 tries before the light bulb. Uh, I mean, if, if he had judged himself based on a school system, which he had been told he was failing, uh, you know, we wouldn't have, as soon as we did, the, the light bulb. You know, and, and so we're lacking in this culture uh, of, of embracing failure, uh, and so we're, we're not seeing the results we need in, in terms of workforce. Uh, at the Digital Hardware Foundation, a, a year and a half ago, um, Shirley Blake Clock and myself set out with a holistic view of, of how could we solve some of these problems? How could we address the needs of education and do so in a microcosm, if, as it were, a, a small test case? And, and we set out to do three things primarily. One was to work with teachers. Uh, we wanted to, to go through the experience of helping understand and being educators ourselves, we really valued and wanted to, to stay close to the ground with educators. The second piece had to do with, with uh, curriculum development. We felt like the curriculum itself as well around schools was also needing kind of some revisitation. And the third piece then had to do with workforce development. How do we help students find their way into meaningful careers and do so at a, at a lower cost than what they were? Because two years of a degree is a very expensive way to find out you don't like something. Uh, you know, whereas trying it out, of, out after school for six weeks, giving your, your hand, you know, giving it a shot and, and trying it out is a, is a very inexpensive way of figuring out whether you do or do not like something. And yet it can also be a very rewarding with a huge ups, upside. I mean, if you're the, the, the youth in England who built the app that Yahoo sold, you know, purchased for 30 million, that was just somebody doing something out, out of school time uh, and exploring on their own, learning something that, that perhaps nobody even taught them how to do explicitly. There was no class they went to. I mean, the internet was built by people who never went to school to build the internet. Uh, you know, and yet, we're expecting that we can, can train and, and have a class around something that will solve problems that we haven't imagined yet. So we, we started out uh, and we, we took this old space, this rec center, that the, the mayor had slated to close down. There were you know, about 50 rec centers and half of them were going to be shut down. In its heyday, Baltimore actually had 150 rec centers. Uh, and they served a purpose in the industrial era. They were an excellent place to, to help people be physically able and fit to work in factories, and also for those that work second shifts to, to have extended daycare. Uh, but in the modern era, they've fallen out of, of a, a role in the economic in, environment, so they see they become a line item expense instead of an investment in the future. And what we said is, as I said, this should be a tech center. This should be a place where kids can go and explore and experiment and discover uh, things that they're passionate about instead of an old, you know, closed down rec center. Uh, so we decided about doing that. This is what it looked like when we first got it. Uh, about three months after we got keys, we reopened it as the Digital Harbor Foundation Tech Center. Had about 300 people in attendance. But what was more important to me is then what happened the next day uh, and the day after that and every day since then that we've had kids in the space working on projects. Uh, you know, here you see Brian uh, on your left. Uh, he, you know, had gone and visited Niagara Falls uh, more than a year ago with his family and noticed on the Canadian side there were all these really nice developments. And on the American side there weren't. Uh, so back home he actually went to Google Earth and found the lot that he thought would be a good spot for a place, measured it, uh, and then using Google SketchUp built a three building complex. Uh, that had residential, commercial, uh, and all sorts of you know, parking and all sorts of retail and other things that he felt like would be a good fit there. Spent more than 500 hours learning how to do this uh, and enjoyed every minute of it, and yet he's never had a class or, or never had any formal instruction, but yet he knows he wants to be an architect because he's done it. 
Uh, and then you can see next to him there's a 3D printer. He was actually waiting until he got it just right to 3D print it. Uh, you know, but, but letting students explore and experiment is incredibly important. And, and it's what will help us develop a, an innovation economy uh, in a location and develop a workforce that really gets that. Uh, and it's also what's going to help, on a national scale, have a conversation around this. And one of the fundamental principles that, that I believe in is this idea of making uh, or producing versus just consuming. You know, education can be a very consumptive activity. It's like sitting in front of a TV. You sit there, you learn. Uh, you, you watch something, the teacher's talking at you. Uh, you know, you perform, you do something, but, it, but it's very consumptive. When the test is over, it's final, it's a disposable sort of learning environment. You know, how many books have just been thrown away after class or notes. But the process of producing is a very uh, engaging and one production leads to another because once you've made something, once you've produced something, you then think about how you can improve it. Uh, and I'll guarantee you that anybody who started a company in here uh, and, know, and did a little bit of their own coding, you know, learned a lot more than, than anybody else in the entire process. You know, and, and I feel that way uh, all the time, that I'm the one that's learning the most because I'm trying to produce something. And if I can get you know, a handful of kids to, to decide they want to produce something, they will learn even more uh, than if I give them an education. Uh, so this summer we've launched uh, what we call Maker Camp. It's part of the Maker Education Initiative. And it's all about getting kids to make things, right? So we divide up into four segments. There's a, a the initial one was about circuits and making uh, things with Arduinos. The next one was 3D printing, which is when the, the student built the, the 3D printer in eight days. Uh, the, the one currently going on is all about game development. And so students are learning in the, the programming language Lua, uh, the platform Corona, which is actually a platform MindGrip uses for its game development, but we have teenagers that right now are learning how to make their own apps and games, and next Friday they have a showcase if anybody's interested. Uh, but the final one that has to do with aerial pursuits, which is uh, quadcopters and things that fly. So kids are making stuff, and every single kid is making a different thing, uh, and people have been amazed by that when they come. They said they're all part of the same camp and they made such different things. Well, the answer is yes, because they were producing something, not consuming what I produced for them. Uh, and, and by allowing them to have these tools, we then are supporting them in, in learning how to learn uh, instead of just learning a specific discrete thing. So you can see here, here's some of the circuits and adventure, uh, and for circuit adventures. Um, yeah, here's some of the other, the other parts. Uh, we also have students working on real world projects. This group of, of kids actually made a website for the governor. Uh, love.maryland.gov uh, back in February, right around uh, Valentine's Day, and they created this website to be a content aggregator. So it would uh, look at Twitter and other places and uh, hashtag MDLove, it gets picked up and aggregated into this website. Uh, you can upload pictures here, but they, they made this website. So these you know, students working on a weekend uh, were, were making something, not just to turn in and get a letter or two numbers as a feedback, but that eyes and people would see that was a real product. Uh, and, I, and I would say that more and more, that's what we need is, is interaction with the real world. Uh, education used to be physically isolated and had to be, uh, just because of the, you know, it was before the telecommunication boom. Uh, now it doesn't have to be, and yet we still isolate, and in fact we turn off communication with the outside world when you walk into to a school building purposefully. And I say, why? You know, uh, why? Why do we do that? Uh, and President Obama, you know, among others, is, are asking for these new models of education. They're asking us to come up with new ways to do these things. And, and my question is, where are we doing that and how? Uh, and what can we do to do a better job? There's going to be lots of failures along the way. You know, I've had my fair share of them. And, and it's no fun. But again, the only failure is failing to improve. And we need to be going through and figuring these things out now. Otherwise, we're, we're never going to figure them out. And the kind of direction that I would, I would take these, uh, the, the initiatives are you know, either, in, in a, they're either going to go in an institutional direction, which is what we've had by and large, or an individual direction. And, and my, propo my proposal is that we go much more student-centric where the specific standards that they're learning are skills instead of discrete knowledge points, um, where it's, it's crowdsourced, where there's a lot of, of interaction and people building real things, uh, where open source is a, is a fundamental aspect of what students are doing, um, where it's not standard, 
uh, and, and the rigor is always there, but, it, but it's, not, uh, it's not always the same thing. Um, you know, and, and that leads me to talk about, for just a minute, the ed tech for tech ed, which is to say that I think all of these amazing tools that we have can, can help students that, that say, I want to be a part of the maker culture, I want to be part of, of those who are producing things, solve some of the problems that we have. I mean, how many of us uh, who have started companies or have worked in, uh, in other spaces are looking for developers and designers and can't find enough of them? You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's a problem that we all face, and yet we have all these students who don't even know that that could be a career, uh, and a really good one at that, that they would have you know, job security uh, as long as they're learning how to learn and continually learning, they'll have a job. You know, and so in Baltimore, I'm working to help build an ad tech ecosystem. Uh, that's, that's one of my passions and something that I've been incredibly amazed by the support from the, the larger community and their, their desire to get behind this and really help build it. But we need these all over the place, right? Uh, we, need, we need every kind of local system building its own ecosystem. And that's one thing about ecosystems is they are local. You know, you, you, you have interactions and touch points, but by and large, each area needs to kind of solve its own problems, and education is one of those areas that is very locally organized. So in that process, we need all sorts of things. Uh, you know, and, and everyone in this room could fill one of these roles, uh, one or the other, being a mentor or a tech coach uh, to help that ecosystem be built. Uh, we also need funding and partnerships. Uh, you know, not just the Digital Harbor Foundation needs this, but but across the board. Uh, so these are things that, that I'm asking for, for individuals here to really activate their networks to help pull together. You know, and, and we really just need to come together and have fun in the process. Because you know, students don't want to grow up if growing up looks so terribly boring and, and like a lot of hard work that's not rewarding. Uh, so you know, we should have fun in the process and we should also just you know, make a difference. Make something worth being made instead of just filling out worksheets, answering questions that have already been answered, uh, and, and solving problems that, that we don't need to actually solve. Uh, you know, that we need to learn those things to solve the real problems, but focus on the real goal, not, not the intermediate step. Uh, that's a, simply a, a, a way to that goal. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and see if there's any questions, but thank you for your attention and time uh, for me to speak here today.